Facebook should the Facebook Live should be streaming now, just FYI. Okay. Now I'm gonna share my screen. And it's just 12, so I'm going to start the webinar. And let's just give, before you start, Barbara, let's just give everybody about a minute to get logged in, okay? Yeah. It's, it's live. Good afternoon. Welcome to our Hot Topics, Affordable Housing, Our Health and Humanitarian Crisis. Um, please stand by for just a moment. We're going to allow a few people to get logged on and then we'll get started. Thank you. Welcome everyone. We'll get started now. Uh, a few people are logging on, but they'll be able to join us and not miss any of our fabulous content today. Um, I'm Barbara Lanning. I am the co-president of the League of Women Voters of Orange County, along with my colleague, Sue Gilman, the other co-president. We want to welcome you all for joining us today. Um, there are, uh, we are going to start off as we always do with the Pledge of Allegiance. So if you can join me now, um, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Um, today, I would like to, first of all, welcome any office holders that we have here in our audience. If you are, sadly, we're not um, where you can stand up and be recognized and um, get some uh, well-deserved claps for your uh, service. But if you'll put it in the chat, we'll give you a virtual clap. Um, there are a few rules you should be aware of. Everyone in the audience um, is muted and their video is off. Um, we are also streaming this uh, webinar on Facebook Live. It is being recorded. And if you miss some of today or perhaps have to get to a meeting, you'll be able to go and see the entire video on the League's YouTube website under Playlist Hot Topics. And it should be up there within a couple of days. Um, the chat is open. Uh, just to remember, if you place anything in the chat, it will be viewable to everyone. 
and it will also be viewable on the recording. So post accordingly. Um, today, uh, our topic could not be more timely. As you probably know, it has been a week since the US Supreme Court struck down an eviction moratorium that was issued by the CDC. And now the tsunami we have long feared is upon us. According to the Orlando Sentinel, as of last Wednesday, approximately 900 eviction cases in Orange County had been completed and an eviction order signed by the judge. And to continue with the weather metaphors, um, this is just the tip of our housing crisis iceberg. A lack of affordable housing means that many people are unable to find a home to buy or rent. Suffice to say, our housing woes are multi-layered and complex. Today, to sort through some of these complexities, we have a panel composed of those in the trenches and leaders in providing innovation solutions to our housing crisis. They will be introduced to you shortly by Donna Dyson, our moderator for today's program. So now let me introduce you to Donna. She is the market president and publisher at Orlando Business Journal. Her early career, as is the case with many of us, consisted of working at a variety of companies. Then she started her career with American City Business Journals in 2007 with the Jacksonville Business Journal as advertising administrator. In 2013, she relocated to advance her career with other ACBJ markets. Donna came to the Orlando Business Journal in 2017, where she led a team as the director of sales until 2018, when she was named market president and publisher. Donna, the program is yours. Well, first of all, thank you so much for um, inviting me to join in today's conversation. Needless to say, it's a very important one and there's much to discuss. So I will jump right in um, and introduce our panel uh, for today. Uh, please know that their bios are online and they are welcome to jump in and share um, a little bit about their company as I call them out. So um, I will start off with Ms. Reverend uh, Mary Lee Downey with Hope Partnership. Good afternoon, I'm so glad to be here with you to share about how we make sure everyone in our community has a safe place to call home. Thank you. And Chris King, Elevation Financial Group. Yes, good, uh, good afternoon. It's wonderful to be with the League of Women Voters again. And uh, this is uh, the perennial issue in Florida. So look forward to discussing. Thank you. And Camilo Barra, Orange County Bar Association. Good afternoon. It's an honor to be here. My organization assists Orange County residents with a number of legal issues. Um, if anyone's facing any sort of legal trouble and you're having trouble affording an attorney, please reach out to our office. We might be able to assist. Thank you so much. So let's jump in today's conversation. Our um, first question is going to go out to Mary. Um, you have been heavily involved in working to meet the housing needs over in Osceola County. Um, could you share a little bit about the successes that you've had over this past year and what new efforts might be in the pipeline? Well, this past year was a very difficult year, as I'm sure everyone can imagine mm -hmm. with the pandemic and with the situation around those who not only were facing housing insecurity, but also food insecurity. And so, you know, one of our biggest successes actually falls into that area for us and being able to help survive, provide some food insecurity services. But when it comes to housing, uh, one of our most devastating but also successful moments was responding to what happened along the 192 corridor in response to the Star Motel and those who were living in hotels and motels in that particular space that became a place that we would call unfit for habitation and our organization in partnership with um, Osceola County and some other providers were able to step in and 33 heartbeats from that hotel are now permanently housed. And so we're incredibly happy that that happened, uh, that we were able to provide that support with some actually COVID relief dollars. And so that it's a huge success for us. And we're happy to see that that has happened a few other times to some other hotels who have struggled. 
Uh, we also have been working pretty diligently to broaden our services across the entire Central Florida area. And one of those ways is that we are currently working to set up a um, service center in the middle of downtown Kissimmee. So we will be able to broaden our services there. And then finally, another success for us is that we made it past the House Appropriations Committee in Congress for an infusion of dollars to help with housing and shelter. And so uh, if we can find out what happens with the budget, we could be seeing some more, do more dollars come into the community very soon to help. That all sounds very exciting. Thank you so much. Um, Chris, our next question is gonna be for you. Your organization has developed a network of private investors that support your organization efforts to revitalize and preserve affordable housing. So while creating a profitable return, what would you say have been some of your successes related to affordable housing this past year? Sure, well, most of my friends from the league uh, will, will know me from the political years in 17 and 18, uh, but prior to that and since mm -hmm. that, um, I have returned to my role as CEO for a, uh, a firm that does affordable housing now in, in many of the areas around the country. So, for example, <laughs> since, since the election of 18, uh, we've launched 12 new communities uh, from everywhere from Massachusetts uh, to Indiana, Illinois, Louisiana, um, and Texas um, across, across the United States. And so I would say from the point of view of, of both an entrepreneur and a social uh, entrepreneur, somebody who is trying to use private capital to meet mm -hmm. public policy uh, need, uh, the years of COVID have been uh, difficult uh, for everybody. It's been very challenging uh, to do this work. Um, uh, however, I'm, I'm very proud that we have, you know, in, in our role, our, our job was to keep people safe and to keep things affordable all over the country. So for example, a project I'm really excited about, we're taking affordable housing to places that have never seen it. Uh, we entered uh, Cape Cod, Massachusetts, one of the most affluent areas in the country. However, also an area much like many affluent areas across Florida, uh, where workers and teachers and, and law enforcement don't have a place to live uh, it was one of the first examples of the political leadership ever allowing affordable housing to be brought into that community, and it'll serve about 135 families. And so we're doing that in lots of different uh, places. I would just end with Florida is, as Reverend Downey stated before, uh, is probably one of the most difficult environments to create build, preserve affordable housing in the country. And I can say that from experience of working all over the nation. Well, that's definitely helpful. It sounds like there's a lot of um, exciting things going on in your space. So thank you so much. Camillo, I would like to pass the ne next question to you, if you don't mind. Um, many people are concerned about the looming eviction crisis and the impact that it will have on our already hard hit segments of the population here. So what challenges does this create for displaced renters and for the judicial system? Thank you, Donna. So I'd start with the crisis is here, guys. Um, the CDC order, it didn't prevent all the evictions out there. Since October of last year, I'm aware of dozens of families that have been evicted for reasons unrelated to the non-payment of rent. Um, there, the majority of those cases that were stayed under the CDC order, a lot of them, they reached a final judgment long ago, and we're just kind of waiting on the issuance and enforcement of the writ of possession, which is what actually removes the tenant from the property on a lot of these cases. Um, so there's a big backlog of those. As always, the moment one of these things gets filed, it's is a permanent blemish on the rental history of the tenant. And what this leads to is when they go to apply to a new place to stay, it's going to come up. It's going to lead to a rejection of applications in many cases. If it doesn't, if they're fortunate enough to, to be accepted, they'll probably be facing a larger security deposit, non-refundable fees, a higher rent, things that they simply can't afford. Um, there's also the situation where Right now, there's a lot of people looking for housing. 
So unfortunately, landlords can be choosy. There's, there's a line of people waiting for housing right now. On top of that, as, as far as I know right now, most shelters are at capacity. So I'm already aware of dozens of families and individuals that are currently living out of cars. They're couch surfing. They don't really have anywhere else to go. Um, I'm also alarmed or have been alarmed throughout this, uh, the whole pandemic at the hesitancy among landlords to file. So what I mean by that is this, I, I've been on a lot of panels, I've been on a lot of webinars where one of the most frequently asked questions by landlords is, when can I file? So what does that tell us? That tells us there's a lot of landlords out there that are not filing, have not been filing. They're just waiting for these protections to go away to actually initiate the process so we can expect an influx of filings that's gonna overload our court system. So in short, we're kind of already experiencing the crisis right now, and it's really not gonna get a whole lot better unless landlords and tenants come together and apply for rental assistance programs, have compassion and patience with one another, and communicate. Simple as that. Communication is definitely key. So. Um... My next question would be for the group, feel free to jump in, whoever wants to take this first. Um, but from your perspective, what do you see as the major housing challenges here in Central Florida that we're facing and what must we do in order to make progress for the, for the community needs? I'll happily step into the beginnings of that, though I know my colleagues here will have uh, similar answers and will be able to give a yes and, I'm sure. Um, obviously, housing stock is our biggest issue, but that is such a complicated answer just in and itself. It is rooted deeply in our living wage issues in our community. It's rooted in the fact that we also have an influx of people coming into our community. And so when we look at housing stock, we look at evictions, we look at the fact that we actually pro probably will not see from a financial standpoint in the housing market anything shift because so many people are coming into our community who can take the units that people are being evicted from. So from a financial standpoint, our community is not gonna take what's gonna look like on paper a huge hit. But what we're gonna see is a lot of people who are gonna have nowhere else to go. And as Camilla already, already mentioned, our shelters are at capacity and struggling. And, um, and then we also need to talk about how racial inequity is also has been at play in our community for a very long time and how we need to be looking internally at what that looks like within our organizations and how we're responding, but also externally as well. Uh, one of the things I think a lot of people are not recognizing is that our, our crisis is not only rooted in evictions, it's also rooted in the fact that many of our property owners understand that as the market increases, they are not renewing their leases. And so people are being forced out of their homes because they simply cannot afford the new market rate rents that our influx of population is, is causing to happen. Anybody else care to add to that? Well, I, I would start or lead with the positive that, you know, Florida, um, there's, there are so many reasons why people want to move to Florida. Um, this is just a gorgeous state. I'm a, I'm a third generation Floridian, a rare commodity in this state. And so what we start with is we're growing by leaps and bounds. And it has been for, I'm 42 years old. It has been for most of my adult life. We just keep growing and growing and growing. And so people need a place to live. The challenge is we've not been as good at growing jobs that pay people uh, a wage where they can afford to live. And we've done a terrible job of keeping up with the creation of housing stock, diverse housing stock that cares for low income, middle income uh, families across Central Florida and in most parts of the state. This is not um, a microcosm here in Central Florida. We're facing it all over Florida. Our friends in St. Pete, our friends in Sarasota, our friends in the Keys, Miami-Dade, Broward. Their, Palm Beach is one of the worst in the country. They're experiencing the same things. So we have a growing state. We have a diminishing housing stock. We have wages that are stagnant. And then you throw in some of the intersectionality issues that uh, Reverend Downey said about race and justice and fairness and opportunity. And it's just kind of the perfect storm for housing. 
And so I, I would suggest there are solutions. We know them. We'll talk about them, I'm sure, in some of the other questions. But if folks with power and influence do not make this a priority, nothing will change. For 20 years, it hasn't been a priority and nothing has changed. And so, you know, I started the company that deals with this work 15 years ago and everyone was talking about affordable housing is a huge problem. Uh, it just, you know, it gets worse year after year after year. And I predict um, unless we have major changes in policy and priority, if we're having this conversation in five years, it will be even worse. Understood. You um, are spot on there. So um, I, I want to kind of pass it back over to Mary, if you don't mind. Um, I know that one of your key goals is to end homelessness in Central Florida. Um, so can you talk a little bit about how, you know, solving affordable housing, you know, plays into that? Housing is a basic human right. And the only way to end homelessness is housing. There is no other option. We can't shelter our way out of homelessness. We can't provide direct services out of homelessness. What ends homelessness is homes. And so as we look at affordable housing and what that means, and not just affordable housing from the very technical terminology, but also what we like to call financially obtainable housing, housing that is affordable for people at the wages that they are making, that, that doesn't exist in our communities. And we haven't built for that. We, we have built for our neighbors in a way of middle class to upper class in most communities. We have this this idea that people are upward moving in their wages. And what we have seen over the last 15, 20, even probably 30 years is that's simply not the case. We have to be able to provide housing at all areas of wages. And so again, when we look at ending homelessness, we can't do it without homes. Absolutely. So Chris, back to you, um, you being a well-known advocate for affordable housing, what would you say that Central Florida does well in that regard? And what are some of the challenges that you think that we have in moving the needle forward? Well, I would start with uh, the solution is larger than Central Florida. Um, this is yeah. a this is a uh, a state and national issue that requi requires demands state and national size uh, investments. So it's very difficult. I've seen, you know, wonderful Central Floridians um, from the business community, uh, from the faith-based and charitable community, try to tackle these issues. And uh, they sign up for a really difficult task because housing, uh, just by the nature of what it is, requires a lot of money, requires a lot of resources. Um, it's complicated. It's challenging. You got to construct, you got to build, you've got to spend. Uh, there's a time lag until it's done. It's hard. And if you don't have significant resources, it's nearly impossible. So, you know, leaders in this community uh, here in Orange County and in others have tried to create special funds, uh, special initiatives, and there have been, um, you know, small successes, I would say, and I don't want to diminish um, what we have been able to do. But this issue, you know, is it requires almost a D-Day type solution. We have those ideas. They've been put in place for about 30 years here in Florida, and we can, we can talk about what those are. But we have essentially walked away, our political leadership has walked away from the big solutions that would change places like Osceola County and Orange County and some of our regional uh, issues. Understood. And we'll have a question that hopefully we'll dig deeper into some of that here in just a moment. Um, I want to pass over to Camilla real quick um, and ask regarding the recent news reports that have been highlighted, the fact that Florida law requires tenants to deposit back rent in order just to even have a case uh, for their eviction. Um, how should the system be improved to help those that have been hit heavily by the pandemic just to even have a fighting chance? 
Thank you, Donna. That is a tough question to answer. I will do my best to answer it in one word and then go into a little detail of uh, what is the system we have and why is it not working? The one word answer I have for you, because it's the only thing I can think of that might help here is mediation. Here in Orange County, for homeowners who are facing foreclosures, we have the opportunity for these homeowners to have a mandated mediation where they can hopefully outside of the courts reach some sort of settlement with the mortgage holders. So whether it be the bank or they or, or whoever it may be that's trying to foreclose on them for whatever purpose, we don't have that for tenants. And we have what we have instead is what you just described, a pay to play system where there's two ways to look at it. There's a initial rent deposit required. If someone is evicting you for the non-payment of rent, just to, just to have a judge listen to you, just to get in front of a judge, to get a hearing or go to mediation, the statute requires you to have all the money you owe deposit it within five business days of being served with the eviction complaint or by the very strict laws, you just lose. You automatically lose the case if you don't have that money. Now, in the past, I've had colleagues who, and I'm talking far, pretty far in the past, have successfully argued that this requirement is unconstitutional in its application. Um, I've had a, I had a colleague who succeeded in convincing a judge as such. What happened in that circumstance? There was a tenant whose ceiling, their roof and ceiling caved in injured the husband, left him unable to work. So of course they couldn't pay the rent because they couldn't deposit. They were going to lose the case, even though it was completely 100% not their fault that the ceiling caved in, that they were unable to pay their rent and they were going to get evicted because they had no way to defend themselves. So that sort of extreme situation shows you that there's some issues with that requirement. The other part of it that a lot of people often forget is it's not just an initial deposit. There's an ongoing deposit requirement. If you have a case pending and by the time your case goes to a hearing, your rent is due again, you need to deposit it into the court registry and failure to do so, just like missing that initial deposit, you automatically lose your case. It's a system that in application does lead to unjust evictions. And the only solution I can think of is maybe we could have a, sim a system that is similar to the, the foreclosure program that we have here in Orange County, where in order to move forward with an eviction, there needs to be the opportunity to have a mediation take place where there's a hope where the tenant might be able to save the tenancy. Thank you so much. So I think that this next question will kind of circle back to some of the things that um, you were kind of touching at, Chris. Um, and this is a group group question, but in the last 24 hours, um, or sorry, previously 24 hours ago, there were, you know, two realtor groups that were proposing constitutional amendments that would ensure money is dedicated to the affordable housing program. So since that is no longer the case, that's not really on the table, the question would be, um, are there other legislative actions that you feel, you know, or could see being pushed forward to help address the issue? And this is for everybody. Sure. Well, what you're referring to, and just for some of the folks who are watching who are maybe uh, less familiar with this issue, is that there is one big idea. There is one sort of affordable housing bazooka, so to speak, that is the big idea that's worth a hundred other ideas. Uh, it's called the Sadowski Housing Trust Fund. It was created in the early 90s. It is the biggest idea in housing with the most significant impact uh, uh, for statewide um, effect. Um, and what that did is, is we had a governor named Lawton Childs in the early 90s, one of my favorites, who created this essentially tax on every real estate transaction. So a little bit of every real estate transaction was put into a piggy bank. And that piggy bank was supposed to create affordable housing. He saw a state that was growing, uh, you know, 30 years ago. And he said, if, if we don't, you know, keep up with creation of, you know, diverse forms of housing, we're going to be plumb out of luck in 30 years. The problem was that that was a trust. That was money put in trust to be used for affordable housing. Um, however, the constituency um, that is largely served by affordable housing in Florida has not always 
um, been adequately represented in Tallahassee. And so what occurred was in the early 2000s, our governors, all GOP governors started um, trying, testing, if they could reach into that piggy bank and take a little bit out of it uh, and put it into other things, whatever they want to do at the time. Maybe there were good things, bad things, you name it, but could they get away with it? Would there be any political um, consequences? Jeb Bush started doing this. Uh, it, it extended into every governor uh, since him. Uh, but those numbers were significant. So today we're talking about almost, I think, two and a half a billion dollars, billion with a B has been raided. So what did the realtors do? Uh, earlier this summer, they said, we're at our wits end. Every year you steal from this fund. Every year uh, you take. And this issue, we have panels all over the state of Florida that are talking about what do we do about affordable housing? This is a big part of the solution. And yet you essentially cut our legs out from under us every year. They bid it in the budget this year, uh, as the, the other panelists will say. So the realtors, not exactly the most progressive of all business groups, said, we're going get, to get in here and stop this. And we're going to do something about it. And they came forward with a constitutional amendment that said, you know, we're going to ensure that the money is spent for what it was supposed to be. There are certain good faith arguments on whether the constitutional amendment they concocted was as um, was as effective as everyone wanted it to be, who it served, home ownership versus rental ownership. But you name it, they were trying to advance uh, the game here. And what happened? Uh, our, our one party system in Tallahassee said, we don't like it. Uh, there are going to be consequences if you keep pushing this. And yesterday, and I think it's headlines today, the realtors came out and they said, well, we've had a series of positive conversations. While we have raised nearly $14 million to advance this, we no longer feel like it's necessary. Uh, we don't have any evidence of what those conversations have suggested is coming. We have zero commitment that the raids won't continue. There is no evidence of any progress on this issue, but it's one further step backward in caring for the very people that most need this money to be invested in affordable housing. That was a very great and detailed explanation. So I do appreciate you kind of giving the audience Kind of an insight into what that um, entails. Um, Mary or Camillo, do you have anything that you'd like to add? I can't follow that. That was perfect. I mean, it really was. Um, and Mary, I saw that you in, in the comments had, had also messaged that Florida has administered about 12% of the emergency rental assistance so far. So thank you for sharing that. Um, I'm about to ask my, my final question for today, and then we'll go to the chat um, where I'll ask Barbara to kind of field some of those if she'd like to jump in. But um, just want to encourage you to get your questions out. You have very um, talented experts at your disposal, um, and they uh, are open and willing to share. So um, our, our final question um, that I have prepared for today for the group is going back to something we had also previously touched on. And, that's the ongoing shortage housing uh, at all income levels have um, caused prices to soar, um, even for traditionally more affordable housing that our service sectors typically would be able to, to have as an option. But um, what can we do to encourage a market rate housing uh, to, re to relieve the need, if that makes sense? Feel like I kind of jumbled that question up a little bit, but basically what do we need to do to help encourage and, and to, to solve the, the middle market housing uh, situation? I think one of the most important things that we need to do as a community and the message that we need to continue to share is that the people who work in our service industry deserve to have adequate housing. Um, I think that for so long, the people who have been the backbone who really make those who are living in our middle class to higher class homes, their quality of life is rooted. And I think we saw this in kind of the shutdowns 
that we needed our essential workers. We needed people to be able to work in those service industry jobs to get Florida back up and running. And if we are so reliant on folks to do that and to work in those spaces as they make our community better, we should be committed to making their quality of life and their housing options just as strong as anyone else who wants to live in Central Florida and the state of Florida. Appreciate that. Anyone else have anything to add before turning it over to our audience? Well, I would say that I think that that political leadership that just did, uh, in my view, the wrong thing for the future of affordable housing has a solution to your question. Um, and the solution, and, and historically, this has been what they have, have expected would fix the issue, is Florida is a feast or famine state. So we go up, we come down. We go up, we come down. And so a lot of the political leadership that has been less excited about investing in affordable housing in many ways is dependent on that come down uh, where uh, housing becomes much more affordable. Uh, landlords can't raise rent by 18 to 25 percent. Houses now are all of a sudden more available to more folks. And so, you know, I, I remember talking to a a leading figure in the GOP, you know, really helping me understand why in 2007 and eight, they raided hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars from the affordable uh, housing trust fund. One of the, you know, the key most, most, most sort of uh, dangerous raids of that fund. And he, he said, you know, we, we saw an economy that was on the way down. We had all sorts of needs. We figured the housing would work itself out. Uh, of course, it didn't. It just got worse. And so right now, we're in a good economy uh, in a lot of the uh, circles of this state. You know, that the haves are in a good economy, and those who are, are sort of not, not able uh, to see their wages grow are not. And but it can get worse. It can even get worse in Florida if all of a sudden sales tax revenues go down, housing. And when that occurs, they're even less likely to invest in affordable housing. They're even less willing to make, uh, in their view, the sacrifices to put the money aside to do it. And so in spite of all of our challenges right now, what we have to really push for is to invest this money now, recognizing it takes three or four years to be felt, not wait for the next recession where everybody's feeling it uh, to talk about affordable housing. Appreciate that. So um, it looks like we're starting to get several questions um, in the chat box. I will do my best to start from the top or um, actually Barbara has just joined us. Um, she's been monitoring, so I'll turn it over to you, Barbara, if you want to go ahead and, and kick us off there. Sure. I'll just sort of take them in the order they came in. Um, besides non-payment of rent, what are some of the other legitimate reasons for eviction? I guess Camila would be our expert there. Thank you. So to try to keep it simple, um, the two most common that I see day in, day out, one would be so you might call it a non-renewal. You might call it a termination of your, of your tenancy. So it kind of depends on what kind of tenancy you have. Uh, we'll do two examples. The first, the most common here in Florida, a lot of tenants don't have leases. They do not have a written lease. They're on a verbal contract with their landlord. And because they rent, they pay their rent monthly, they're considered a month to month tenant. Um, at least most of my clients are in this position. That is an extremely, unstable and vulnerable housing arrangement. Why? All your landlord needs to do, unless you have a written document giving you more rights than this, all your landlord has to do is give you a 15 day notice that this is the last month. We need you out at the end of this month and next month you're not our tenant. How does that 15 day notice function? It has to be in writing and it has to be 15 days away from the current, from the end of the current rental period. So what does that mean? If I got a letter today, from my landlord saying, hey, you gotta be out at the end of this month. And if you're not, I'm gonna evict you. If I'm a month to month tenant, I better be out at the end of the month because next month, the first, if I'm still there, they can open that eviction case against me. It's really hard to fight against those evictions because there's not really any legal defense to, to staying past your welcome. 
and it can proceed pretty quickly. And the most important, a lot of people forget this, if it comes to that, that's on your record permanently. So that's one of the most common forms of evictions outside of non-payment, a non-renewal or a termination of a month-to-month -month tenancy. Um, a little more on that, another example would be like, let's say your lease has an expiration date and it does not say that you have like a, a right to renew or this is how you renew. It just says it expires this day and it's silent as to everything else. The day that lease expires, if you haven't gotten permission to stay, you're at risk of one of those evictions because you overstayed your welcome. Now, the other one, which we could talk all day about, but I'll try to keep it simple, it'd be a lease violation. So if your lease says no cigarettes, don't you dare smoke cigarettes in that house. You can get evicted for smoking cigarettes. Um, another thing that pretty frequently falls under kind of the same thing is if you break the law. If you break the law on the rental property or if, if your lease says no breaking the law, which pretty much all of them say, you can get evicted for that. So those are the two most common outside of non-payment. <clears throat> Violating your lease one way or another, or your lease is properly terminated or expired and you stay past. Okay, thank you. Um, the question about the funds, uh, Mary uh, Lee answered in the chat. So let's see. Um, where's the next one? Um, this is a question. It says, why is Florida so difficult relative to this subject? Is it politics or funding? Um, I guess I might also add, are we difficult um compared to other states or do we think we're special and there are many states with the same identical problems mary lee do you have any idea about that i'm sure you must speak at conferences and things and you may have um, relationships with people in other states I do believe, and I think Chris has already kind of alluded to this, that we do have more barriers in Florida than are in other states. I'll take uh, hotel conversions as one of those things. That's a option that's being utilized around the United States. California did an entire program with their COVID relief funds around uh, hotel conversions as a housing opportunity. Um, and so I do believe that we put more barriers up in this community. I think some of it has to do with um, just the lack of, of uh, stepping into new ideas. I think sometimes if I want to give people a little bit of grace around this is that it's, it's risky to try something new. It's risky to step outside of, of what might be conventional, what we've always done. And so I, I do believe that, that we are a little stagnant in that space, but I, I'm sure Chris probably has even more as his company is, is nationwide. I think I think we're, we've operated in about 13 states, and I think it's just a combination. People want to live in Florida. I mean, it's a state of 21 million folks, and the wage issues we talked about. So, and just the lack of political leadership on the issue. So, I think probably what we're missing here that other places have is, you know, we um, we don't have those strong, powerful, influential political forces that make this a priority. In other words, you know, this is an emergency. We're talking about housing is now an emergency issue in Florida, um, but it's not a priority to those in power. And so what changes that, those who are in power who will make this emergency a priority is when organizations um, of great influence say, this is a top three. This is the year, you know, if the realtors had carried through, um, they might have made a big impact. If, if you know, the, uh, the Florida Chamber of Commerce said this was important, this was as important as tax, taxes or other things. And I have a lot of friends there. I'm an entrepreneur, um, but I'll be the first to tell my friends this hasn't been a priority. We talk the talk, but it's not a priority. Um, you know, if some of our wonderful, large businesses, and I don't have to mention names to know who I'm talking about, if they said, we are going to use our influence, our lobbying, our political uh, state senators and state representatives will come to their side in a New York minute. That's how it works. But when you don't use your influence uh, to make it a priority, 
it's not going to change. I will say that um, the league, the rating of the Sadowski funds, that has been a perennial thorn in our side. And we are certainly speaking up. Um, I don't know what else we can do, but certainly league members are very happy to speak up for this. And if there are things that you think we can do, any of you, um, we certainly want to hear about it. Um, we go to Tallahassee, we lobby, and certainly this is something we're always trying to see how we can um, stop those raids from happening. Um, okay, let's go on. Um, it says the White House has just released their plans to build and restore more than 2 million homes and expand outreach to local governments and nonprofits to buy federally held homes. How do we take advantage of these two federal programs in Orlando, Orange County? Um, I don't know if those are part of the infrastructure plan. I'm not sure what that refers to. I don't know if any of you know. That's new that, that we just found out actually about yesterday, couple, last couple of days, um, and we have been exploring it just, just today, looking at what that looks like. Basically, the premise is that trying to, as, as units become available in communities, trying to give some space for nonprofits to pick up those units as opposed to them quickly being flipped by people and investors. And so the idea is that nonprofits and other leaders that are focusing on affordable housing could pick up those units and begin to use them as a rehousing option. Uh, keep them within that affordable rate, because that is another thing that continues to happen is that as property value grows and people are able to charge higher market rent, we see just this influx of people not being able to. So a place that really has happened has actually been manufactured homes. Manufactured homes are being picked up by investors. The rents are being raised just astronomically. And then also we just lose the little bit of inventory that we actually have. So this is in response to being able to get some of that inventory back to the population that needs it. Um, I think the answer to that is, is I would love to see jurisdictions partnering with nonprofits, putting funding aside. Uh, I think that there is an absolute opportunity here to really pick up those units and reinvest them back in the community. But I don't know that we have any non nonprofits in Central Florida with enough capital to do that at a large scale. But if we did it in partnership with jurisdictions or private investors, we could really change that narrative. Okay. Um, some say the government regulations for the environment, for example, or fees such as impact fees, are an important factor in making housing less affordable. Um, do any of you have thoughts on where, what, if that's true? Well, Reverend Reverend Downey alluded to it, and you know, it's it's back to the same old story. Housing is nuanced; it's complex to create, to build, and impact fees in their you know, at their best are, are put in place for a good reason, right? Um, the concept, you're going to bring a lot of new people into a community. You've got to serve them well with roads and schools and services. They make sense intuitively. The challenge in a place uh, like Florida is when we're behind the eight ball on housing is when you then add impact fees to the equation, you can create some real disincentives to ever getting the housing you need. Take Osceola County where Reverend Danny works. And, and she referred to the fact that, you know, we just went through a, a very narrow window of time where there was a tremendous amount of housing stock for just that window of time available for potential long-term preservation of affordable housing. What she referred to as the hotel kind of motel reconversions along that uh, corridor, the I-92 corridor. You know, we, we were just one of a number of folks who got very close uh, to trying to do, you know, a big, a big something there in Osceola County at a big level. And as Reverend Downey knows, we, you know, we worked on it for six or seven months. Uh, the challenge is that without any innovative actors uh, in the community from a, a public sector uh, perspective, and you throw on impact fees that are very high because Osceola County needs that money, 
um, it makes it from a private perspective nearly impossible to make it work, to put all the pieces together uh, because we, we had to get that housing stock at such a low price, at such a low price to be able to add all those impact fees and then redevelop it to serve the communities. And so you just didn't see too many examples of that working. And then now the price of those hotels has gone, is, is increasingly going up as we exit or get ready to exit the COVID era. And so that's just an example, a practical example of where impact fees sometimes can really get in the way of progress. Thank you. Um, we had a question here. How can we encourage municipalities who are administering rental assistance programs to speed up the process, lessen unnecessary requirements, and provide assistance to those who need assistance with the online application process? Um, I think that we've talked maybe a little bit around the edges, but um, I, I, I've uh, have someone that I know personally that is not digitally minded. He's an older gentleman with few resources. He can't go online to do anything. Um, are there programs to reach out to people like him who need help um, to do this? Or where can people go uh, to help navigate the bureaucracy? I'll find I mean, look, Yeah. So I'll start with, with um, the question that was in the chat. How can we encourage the municipalities to be more efficient? Point out to them their inefficiencies. Show them that there's guidance from the Treasury Department that gives them a lot of flexibility that they're not utilizing. And then another great thing to do is don't apply to them. Apply to the programs that are less, uh, less restrictive. The Our Florida program, Pretty decent program, not very restrictive. It is following the treasury guidelines to my knowledge. Um, point out to them that there's better programs out there and that's who's gonna get applied to if, if these programs don't get it together. Um, now, as to your question, and now I lost your question. What was your question, Barbara? I'm so sorry. Okay, hold on, I was scrolling down now. Um, oh, the, the, how, how we did ask them to speed right. up the process and your um, question was, was how, how to assist the individuals who have a, a, an accessibility issue. So that's a tough thing to address on a general level because there's people all across the state with those problems. But I'm aware of at least one organization, a sister legal aid organization of ours, the Community Legal Services of Mid-Florida. They operate in multiple counties throughout Florida. They actually have events that I want to say are like weekly at this point where they're having people come in and they're assisting them navigate these different programs. And this is a great um, resource, the Community Legal Services of Mid-Florida, their website will help you find out when these, uh, when these events are and how to get there and who they serve. Um, unfortunately, they don't serve every single county in Florida though, so that, that doesn't help everywhere. But I would hope that maybe there are other organizations throughout Florida that are doing similar events where people go out and they can help them apply. Okay. Um, I have another question about major employers that has kind of been touched upon. Are any of the major employers in our state and area, uh, Disney, hospital chains, Publix, uh, et cetera, helping to solve our housing problem. Obviously higher wages help, but anything else? Does anybody I know speak from, I can speak from a nonprofit standpoint. I mean, a lot of our major employers are supportive of our work, have been supportive of our work in the past and continue to, to do so. Um, and and I, I would love to see even more investments and so I think it's a both and uh, solution. I, I love what our, our companies have done thus far. And I'd love to see, um, especially around advocacy and, and as, as Mr. King said earlier, the idea of, of making it a priority and, and being sure that it's a priority. Do you think that um, the difficulty in finding workers these days might, um, push some of these people. I'm thinking of the hospitality sector, um, which is down where you are. Um, they have a, a massive need for people. And um, 
I'm wondering if they recognize this as any kind of a problem and housing is one way to attract workers. Absolutely. And I think that we're going to see more and more folks raising those wages. I, I will brag on Westgate for, for a minute because I saw them immediately respond when they were not able to get people in hospitality industry raise their, their minimum rate for housekeeping to $17 to $18 an hour. I mean, that's just amazing. And so I'd love to see other companies follow suit uh, and start thinking about how we can make sure that, again, everybody has a good, strong quality of life, especially those in our service industry. Right. Um, I have a question for Chris about Cape Cod. Uh, did the state or local government lead or support an affordable housing project? What kind of partnership created the environment to make an affordable project available? Do you, I don't know if you know. Well, we're, we're all private, so it's all private uh, dollars, uh, but yes, the political leadership there um, really, they had never done anything like this. They'd never seen anything like this, but they, um, after, you know, uh, uh, kicking in our tires, they recognized they had such a significant issue in their tourism. Cape Cod is obviously in the New England area, a real destination, um, but there is a a, a, a real barbell between those who live there and those who serve that um, who serve that community. And so, um, you know, we we came in and, and cast a vision to uh, to um, essentially develop 135 um, you know affordable homes, and um, and it was you know we won those folks over. Um, and just returning to your question before on big corporate actors, I think that. You know, there's always, I mean, we're all, everybody's doing something to help. Everybody wants this to get better. Uh, they're all, most of, most of the folks are good people with good intentions. Um, the challenge is this, is this is a problem at great scale and it requires great scale and leadership. And so if our friends, if our friends at Disney, if our friends at Universal, said that they're going to use their influence to stop the raids on the Sadowski Housing Trust Fund. There would be nothing as significant for affordable housing in the last 30 years in Florida. And they have the, they have the influence to do it. And I think it would make their businesses soar uh, in the Central Florida area. That is um, an excellent point. Um, finally, we're just about out of time. Um, is there anything that you can think of that we can do uh, individually, collectively to help with this problem? Um, we like to be able to always come away with this uh, from these sessions with actions that we can take to help ameliorate the problems that we've discussed. So Camilo, do you wanna kick it off and then each of you can maybe give a short answer? Sure. For me, it's always, always going to be community education. That involves telling tenants what are their rights. That involves telling landlords what are their rights. That involves telling the community how can they get involved with our political process. What are these issues? How can they be handled? There's just so few people who are aware of these issues and that's the only way we're going to get anywhere is people need to be made aware. Thank you. Mary Lee? So I saw someone mention in the chat that this conversation was frustrating and angered them. And I want to, to affirm that feeling. Um, please get angry. It, it's time to get a little angry about the fact that our neighbors don't have safe places to call home. It's time to be honest about that. And, and being angry is not always bad. Being able to have righteous anger about what it is that our community deserves and speaking out and being educated on it and going forward and sharing that is the most powerful tool that, that this group of, of, of women have in this League of Women Voters, so thank you. Thanks, Chris. Well, I just wanna thank the League. I mean, what you're doing is you're continuing to remind us and, and I've been a part of so many of these across the state and whether you take on you know gerrymandering or housing or healthcare or, or you name it, it's just reminding us of what the solutions are and, and how we advance them. You know, I, 
I look at the articles from just this morning about this this latest sort of hit to housing uh, with the realtors backing down. And I would just suggest, you know, I think the league for for any members of the league across the state of Florida, you know, it, it now looks like there's a uh, there's a senator to be who will be the president of the Senate. And, you know, Kathleen Pasadomo, you know, who was a part of of sort of keeping the, you know, halting the realtors in her tracks, but she's saying things we would want to say that, hey, let us fix this. So, you know, I would just, um, I would just invite members of the league across the state of Florida to really, you know, uh, lobby the senator to be a hero um, on housing, to be a champion, to do the right thing and stop the raids. And if she can do it through legislation, all power to her. It'll be her legacy for a hundred years. Uh, and I think the league could, uh, you know, be a big part of that. Thank you. Thanks, Sue. I'll turn it back over to you. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, and thanks everyone for being here to our moderator and our panel speaking on behalf of the league. We appreciate your knowledge and your time this morning so much. Um, Camilo, you mentioned community education and that's one of the things that the league is all about. We want to help inform our community about these really important subjects. Um, and I, I just want to get one quick plug in for the league and invite all of you to become members of the league. We have lots of men who are members and um, by, and your support will help us accomplish our goals. So lwvoc.org and membership is very easy. We'd love to have you join us. Um, we also want to thank our housing committee for their work on this topic. Um, they really helped us immensely to assemble the panel, to assemble the program. Great questions, great, you know, they really helped us frame it well. And one of the things is th that the league is all about is our committee work. If you are not currently participating in a committee as a member, you are missing out on a big part of the league experience and the opportunity to really make a difference. So um, please check the calendar on our webpage and figure out which committee is right for you and get involved because making a difference is why we are here, right? I think so. Um, if you are looking for a committee that you may want to join, an organizational meeting is being held on September 14th at 6 p.m. for our um, for the formation of our new events committee. And as you know, we put on a lot of events, some big, some small, some you know um, out in the community, some more part of the league and. Um, we need your help. So if you like to organize, manage, blog, if you're, you've got graphic skills or decorating skills, you're a Zoom master because we always need help with that, um, please uh, attend this meeting. Um, and then finally, on September 28th, it's National Voter Registration Day. And if you're interested in what our plans are for that, please get involved with the Voter Services Committee meeting, which is being held on September 13th. Okay, thanks everyone for your time. I really appreciate you being here and we as the league appreciate you all. Bye-bye. <laughs>